Romeo Paradox, the founder of Green Craft. He had 25 years of experience in the commercial construction industry. He has a passion to improve efficiency in construction, and that has led to the development of highly energy efficient building envelope systems and accelerated concrete curing systems. He is now in the process of taking green craft technology to market and revolutionizing the construction industry. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, we got the few and the brave today. Um, Want to thank Anne for getting me over here, allowing me to speak to you all this morning. Um, I didn't realize that I joined the Club of Concrete Rogues. Uh, Mark, uh, where is he? Thank you for letting us know that yesterday. Um, so, Greencraft. What are we doing? Initially, we started developing a highly energy efficient building envelope. And out of that came some interesting observations about um, what happens when you insulate concrete and you can accelerate concrete curing. And some technology came out of that. And <clears throat> with that, uh, especially low carbon mixes that we call them high performance super green concrete mixes. Um, so I want to, as an icebreaker, um, take a look at this uh, picture. Beautiful bridge, Ravenel Bridge over Cooper River in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Is North America longest stayed cable bridge. Opened in 2005, $700 million. The DOT mandate, 100 year chloride resistance. Fast forward three years later, and <clears throat> you're going to see a bunch of surface cracking and up in this area and many, many places, you'll see efflorescence coming through these cracks. Earlier this year, going 60 miles an hour, you see a bunch of more surface cracking, more efflorescence. So you're going to eventually somebody's going to ask if this is acceptable. Um, I'm not going to go into what's the cause. There'll be plenty of experts going into that. Uh, but the depending and different opinions, depending on which side of the table they be sitting. Um, what I want to um, ask the question is, as an industry, as a taxpayer, as <clears throat> the DOT, uh, is this acceptable? Uh, how is it that the Roman concrete structures were sitting in salt water for thousands of years and, you know, in, at least in the state of Georgia that I live in, um, most of brackish water bridges are falling apart. They're only 40 years old on average. Now another icebreaker, <clears throat> Trump Tower Hotel in Chicago. Um, uh, tallest concrete structure in the world at a time. Um, Donald Trump, very proud of it. Every time you go there, it's all over the place. He was the first to build the tallest concrete structure before Dubai. Um, and you sit down in a meeting with him as the contractor, and he tells you, speed is everything. Without the speed, it just doesn't happen, and you can't be successful. I want real quality, but I want speed. So what are you going to do? You got almost 100 floors to go up. He tells you speed is money, and you got to work four to seven days per floor cycle. So <clears throat> the structure engineer specified a certain strength, but the reality of it is that you can kind of need that strength in about five days just to maintain schedule. The specific mixes, I was sitting in a high performance concrete design class at the World of Concrete last year. Uh, I'm, not expert, I'm, a, I'm not an expert in that area, but it just seems that on a basic level, if you need more speed, you just have to add more powder. Whatever that is, cement, silica, fume. When you get more powder, you get more heat. Um, they're going to add chemicals to factor in some of that stuff. The cost of the mix goes, you know, through the roof. Um, but hey, 
They make the schedule. Donald Trump is happy. And um, the question is to me, is there another way? Um, <clears throat> I mean, is adding more powder the only way to go faster? Can you get the same speed without costing so much in the concrete mix? So if you indulge me for a minute, I want to take you to talk about speed. So you go back to the times of uh, the last code update. And uh, <clears throat> fastest stock car of the 60s, a Ford 428 custom police interceptor. 428 cubic inches, 345 horsepower, a Holly four barrel carburetor, 735 CFM. Probably on average you do five miles to the gallon. I don't know, uh, on a slow, um, slow go, may do 10 miles an hour. Is getting a whopping 45 horsepower per liter. Zero to 60, 7.3 seconds. And you're like, that's not fast enough. We got to go faster. So what do you do? You bring in Bumblebee. And now you can really go fast. What is it going to take? Add more fuel. How? Well, this is my friend's bill, um, 69 Camaro. He, um, he put in a 527 cubic inches engine in it. Um, the 350 that came with it was not good enough. 720 plus horsepower. Um, you need some serious air pump to go with it. Uh, Holly King Damon, four barrel, about 1200 CFM. Don't ask him how, uh, what's the gas mileage. He, he doesn't count it by, by miles. He counts it by inch of columns. I mean, uh, of gas, uh, inches of, of gas column. Uh, it'll do zero to 60 in about three seconds, that if, if the rubber sticks. Um, so 75, and all of a sudden, you look at this engine, you got 75 horsepower per liter. Um, almost double uh, of the stock car. Now, you fast forward to current times, and this is a Sally. Um, when I met Sally, I lost my mind. And I can't tell you how good it felt, and here's why. Um, <clears throat> 510 horsepower, twin turbo, with variable uh, turbine geometry, six-speed six Tiptronic, all-wheel drive. That comes in very handy. It's very forgiving. You do 17 miles to the gallon in the city, 25 miles to the gallon on the highway. And take a look at that. Out of 3.6 liter engine, you get 510 horsepower. That's stock. 140 stock horsepower per liter. That's three and a half times as much as you know the stock car of the 60s. Zero to 60, 3.4 seconds all day. No issues. So <clears throat> you look at 25 miles a gallon. What does it take to move a ton and a half at 100 miles an hour down the highway, getting 25 miles to the, to the gallon. You have 90,840 drops of gasoline in one gallon. And at 25 miles a gallon, basically one drop, one drop of gasoline, it'll move that ton and a half at 100 miles an hour, one and a half feet down the highway. Now that's efficiency. So you say, hey, what does that have to do with concrete? or what we're talking about here. <clears throat> well, we all know this, <clears throat> but I just want to keep this in mind when we look at the next thing that I'm going to show you. To me, cement powder is fuel. The question is, so we all knew that. The question is, what do we do with this fuel? <clears throat> Over here, basically, um, in the process of developing these composite insulated forms, um, I done a lot of testing of panels, testing of, of um, concrete um, cast in the same environment, in the same off of the same uh, concrete batch, um, cure side by side. So in that process, we wired uh, Intellirox sensors to the concrete in a conventional form. We wired. Um, the lamppost in the shade to track the ambient temperature and uh, did cylinder labs. So what you're going to see here is that basically in the first, 
12 hours or so, a conventional concrete form is going to, you know, raise the heat of hydration, reach a peak temperature. Generally, in the evening, you know, before midnight or so, provided you pour the concrete sometime before noon. And then immediately, <clears throat> as you're losing this heat to the environment, is going to drop that by the next morning you come to have ambient temperature. And from that point on, pretty much conventional form concrete is going to track the daily temperature fluctuation of the environment for the rest of that structure. So <clears throat> talking about temperature shrinkage cracking, um, that 20 plus degree, almost 30 degrees Celsius drop at about 12 to 16 hours, 24 hours. The concrete in that form at that point is probably 1,000, 1,500 PSI. It is least able to take that stress of that temperature shrinkage, let alone the cycles of expansion and contraction before it comes up to specified strength. And so <clears throat> you look at the cylinder in the lab, and it's just groovy. It has no resemblance to what's going on out in the field. Uh, it's just cruising down nicely. So here's some infrared pictures <clears throat> of some of these forms that you can see um, how the face of the conventional form is pretty much the same temperature as the concrete inside the form. And you can see the radiation of the heat escaping the form, um, kind of like you see in that chart. So <clears throat> conventional form basically exposes the concrete to thermal shock and daily stresses, um, especially when the concrete is young. Um, when you get the nano cracking at 24 hours, that's the surface cracking later. Uh, this is a 28-day chart. Uh, we fast forward to a 90-day chart of tracking all that temperature. Concrete in a conventional form has a rough ride. Um, <clears throat> so is there some that you can do about this? Can we improve this? Um, when we were developing these composite insulated concrete forms um, and we wired them with the same Intellirock, filled them up with concrete from the exact same batch, um, just moved the, the pump hose over, you can see here that in that insulated form, <clears throat> the temperature keeps rising well beyond the temperature uh, peak of the conventional form. Uh, we get about 56 Celsius in about 36 hours, and we stay there for half a day, and then gradually about 2 degrees Celsius a day, we lose that ambient temperature to come to the same temperature as the environment in about 14 days. Uh, this was done in the springtime in April. So you have average weather, you know, you can see the ambient temperature. We gone down to the 40s, you know, a couple of nights, generally, you know, 50s at night, uh, perhaps like California weather. Um, so <clears throat> we call this the smart cure. Retain the heat of hydration, eliminate the thermal stresses, the daily temperature fluctuations, and <clears throat> at 28 days, you start seeing in this chart a pattern to where while in a conventional form you have these tremendous swings of temperature, in that insulated form, unless you have some major you know, shift in the weather pattern, you pretty much stay within one or two um, degrees Celsius of, you know, from day to day. Um, so, this is another picture of the morning after. Uh, <clears throat> the dark form here and there is an insulated form. <clears throat> Basically, the surface, the outside temperature, uh, the surface temperature of the outside insulated form is the same as the um, objects in, in the environment. Um, while the concrete inside that form is twice as hot. Um, 
<clears throat> you look at the conventional form, you basically are the same temperature of the concrete inside the form as the, uh, the outside face of the form. So we look at maturity, Celsius hours, in these three instances, conventional form, lab curing, uh, and the insulated form. <clears throat> and, you know, everybody starts at the same line. Um, and then you start seeing the segregation. At 24 hours, we almost have twice as many Celsius hours packed in um, the insulated form. At three days, um, <laughs> we're almost three times as much. Uh, seven days, <clears throat> you're more than double. Um, as time goes on, the difference gets to be narrower. Um, so we cord samples, a couple of samples out of each panel. And <clears throat> the, the, the cores were, were done at five days. Um, then a weekend came and they didn't break them until the eighth day. So the insulated core, basically, it was hot when it came out, but then it cooled off. So the last couple of days, you know, from day fifth through the day eighth, it didn't follow the same pattern as the concrete in the form itself. Yet, we have 6,100, 6,200 PSI, while the conventional form you have 3,200 PSI, the lab cylinder you have 31 PSI, and this is, this is a, a mix with quite a bit of Portland cement, 540 pounds of Portland cement, 120 pounds of F fly ash. And um, so that mix will do good in just about any environment. Um, but yet, in our insulated form, we get twice as much the strength um, at, at about six, seven days that you do in the lab or in the conventional form. 28 days, uh, 6,600 PSI versus 4,600 PSI. Um, it takes to get to day 90 to basically get the same strength of that mix in the conventional form as the green craft form. Um, we've done some coring 14 months after the fact. Almost 8,000 PSI. And I gotta tell you, this concrete mix, <clears throat> um, the first generation of the insulated forms, we did not vibrate that concrete. We had an eight inch slump uh, mix and we basically poured it um, when we were pouring this building. And uh, it was 30 meter, um, five inch line uh, pump truck. And the way it came down the, uh, the hose, that's just the way we, we left it. We did not vibrate. So you could have, I'm sure, better results if that concrete was properly vibrated. Um, but uh, you get the idea. Um, so we, we did a number of different concrete mixes, as I told you. Um, this mix here is a very low carbon concrete mix. Um, 220 pounds of Portland cement, 215 pounds of slag cement, 215 pounds of F uh, fly ash. And <clears throat> in a conventional form, you can see there's not a lot of heat, there's not a lot of energy in it. Um, you get about, in the same environment, about 35 degrees Celsius um, in that mix. And then, again, you drop the same way uh, by next morning, your ambient temperature. You follow the same up and down uh, pattern. Um, you can see the smooth sailing of the cylinder um, in the lab. Um, and it's the same thing. We insulate we extract that data, and in this particular mix, you have a gradual buildup of heat inside that concrete form to where it takes about, you know, two days to reach maximum temperature. And you plateau and you hang out over there for about a day and a half, and you then, a uh, Celsius degree a day, you start coming down to, again, about 16 days or so um, you get um, ambient temperature. Uh, we've done a number of um, microscope testing, um, SEM, you know, pictures. Um, all of that kind of goes over my head, but this is the one that I can understand. Um, where you can see the moisture loss in a conventional form, um, 
and you start getting microcracking out of moisture loss. Um, in the conventional form, we retain both the heat and the moisture. And so you can see the pace difference between the conventional insulated. Now, <clears throat> in the um, temperature, uh, um, the maturity tables, um, kind of about the same um, pattern. You can see at 48 hours, we have almost you know, 900 um, Celsius hours in a conventional form, 1,600 Celsius hours in the insulated form, seven days, 3,300, 5,400. Um, we go core, and this is the amazing thing. This is, this is why nobody can use this mix in the real world. The cylinder labs at seven days, they're 980 PSI. Uh, Try to break those cylinders and say, now we're stripping forms. Le I mean, let alone uh, I'm stripping, uh, shore, uh, reshoring, let alone the forms. Uh, same thing, core at five days, break them at eight days, 1,400 PSI in a conventional form, 5,000 PSI in the insulated form. It doesn't, it takes about um, 45 days for that to get uh, in the cylinder lab and somewhere between, you know, around 60, 65 days probably for that strength to come up in the conventional form. That's why they call them what? The 60 day, you know, ultimate strength uh, when they specify these mixes, the 90 day strength, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Um, <clears throat> 90 days, 6,600, 5,600 PSI in a conventional form. At 14 months, 7,500 PSI, um, 5,830. So to go back to 1971, if you walked into a Detroit executive office and you said to them, hey, um, outside in the parking lot, <clears throat> I got this car with this engine that is going to have three and a half times more horsepower per liter, um, is going to use a third of the gas, um, a fraction of the emissions, they call the security on you. They say, hey, that's just not possible. Um, yet, that's kind of the same thing that we got here. Um, <laughs> the door is right here, strategically placed. <laughs> uh, so we call these mixes. Uh, the truly sustainable mixes, we call them high performance, high performance super green concrete. Um, it'll have denser pace, lower permeability, increased, um, you know, um, physical properties, durability, higher strength, um, reduce calcium hydroxide, uh, higher temperature resistance, and with all of this, increased life cycle. Um, Last year, there was this really, really interesting study I found, Unlocking the Secrets of the Roman Concrete, done, um, headed out of Berkeley here, but uh, if you look at the list of participants from all over the world, uh, Europe, three or four different places, Middle East, um, Asia. Um, so, <clears throat> Roman Concrete, um, aluminum to berm right. Um, everybody's like, how do you make that? How do you make that? Why can't we make that? And here is, uh, I think, from page 10, uh, what the modeled temperature profile of curing that concrete. And in this paper, um, they say that the surface temperature of that concrete uh, curing was between 56 to 68 Celsius, um, degrees Celsius. At the core, 85 to 97 Celsius. That's like bubbling, boiling hot concrete. Um, so the folks in 2004, uh, they said, hey, let's, we got all this science, let's, let's reproduce this. And in 2009, they were still hoping they're going to get this concrete to develop aluminum to bermerite. And none of them was found. Um, among other reasons, they quote that the rapid loss of heat in the small structure produced obstacles to aluminum to bermerite crystallization. So, <clears throat> folks are afraid of heat in many places. Um, 
Roman concrete needed a lot of heat. Um, perhaps that's the secret of why it lasts 2,000 years, that aluminum to berberite that needs high temperature. We haven't tested Roman concrete in the insulated forms, um, but I believe that by retaining the heat of hydration, we can sustain and maintain that high temperature to where we could perhaps cure and crystallize um, aluminum to berberite. Um, we hear a lot about ultra-high performance concrete. Uh, aside from the patching, you know, compounds and you get in the bag or whatever, uh, the poor backs of, of bridges and, and stuff, real structure of ultra-high performance concrete have only been made in a precast plant uh, where you have uh, high temperature curing basically provided by a steam uh, cure room. Um, we have not tested ultra high performance concrete in the insulated form, but again, I believe that by retaining the heat of hydration, ultra high performance concrete is possible to cure and make in cast in place forms out in the field. Um, so the question at a basic simple level to me is, what's best for concrete? Um, in my book, we gotta eliminate the thermal stress at least before it reaches the specified strength. So this temperature drop, uh, eliminate that temperature drop, we should get a um, huge improvement in concrete performance. Second thing, eliminate the calcium hydroxide. Eliminate that efflorescence so it doesn't you know, blow from the inside. Uh, if we can eliminate the thermal stress for the life of the structure, uh, then I believe you can really take concrete well beyond anything conceivable now. So what's um, our solution, if you will? Insulate concrete at least for three to five days in, until it reaches 80-90% um, of specified strength. Um, if you can insulate concrete for the life of the structure, that's even better. So. I tried to explain to people, what is this? Because it sounds like a lot of things that a lot of, um, a lot of us know already. Um, but it's kind of like an operating, a concrete operating system that any application, any concrete that you place in a system where you retain the heat of hydration will have improved properties. Um, you can accelerate concrete curing so you don't have to, uh, in order to get 6,000 PSI uh, in five days, when the structure engineer only needs 6,000 PSI, uh, perhaps you don't have to use a 14,000 PSI mix um, just to get there in five days. Um, you can dial down the powder, you can dial down the heat. Um, in a system where you retain the heat of hydration, uh, conventional concrete, as we can see, you can achieve the ultimate strength in about three to five days. Now, low carbon concrete mixes 90% of ultimate strength in about five to 10 days. <clears throat> this operating system is gonna allow the use of the next generation type concrete out in the field, not just you know, in a control environment. Because basically what we're doing is we're eliminating a lot of the variables um, in the field um, associated with concrete curing. Uh, and with that, you will have improved performance on the job site, and you will save money on the mixes to begin with, um, and time. So, thank you for listening to me.